Um, good evening, uh, welcome, and uh, offer you a very warm welcome to the university um, this evening. Um, I'm Christopher Benerith, I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Business here at the university. Uh, I'm just going to do a, a short introduction. Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you here tonight to listen to the inaugural Professor Oriol Lecture of um, Catherine Willis. Got it right. Uh, becoming a professor is a, a very significant event in an academic's career and it takes a lot of time and dedication to reach this point. Um, above all, it takes a passion and belief in what you are working towards and Catherine has that in spades. A professor is the highest level of academic standing, which basically means you've been recognised as an international authority within your field, so it's a very significant step. One of the things a professor does is profess. Um, which means Catherine is going to talk to you tonight, I hope anyway, uh, uh, about what she's an international expert in. Uh, we've just been talking, um, Catherine and I, about this, and, and the challenge um, for Catherine this evening is to give a presentation that will engage the experts in her field, who are sitting in the room, as well as the lay person who has absolutely no technical understanding whatsoever, like myself. That's no mean feat. Um, we open our inaugural lectures to the public purposefully to make evenings like this just a little more challenging for our professors. Um, on a personal note, I've been impressed with Catherine's commitment to her field uh, since the time I joined the university as then head of school for art, design uh, and architecture when we had some very initial conversations about what she wanted to do and the things that she wanted to accomplish. It's been fantastic to watch her achieve these ambitions over the last six years and to reach the point this evening where we are able to celebrate her promotion to professor and all of the achievements she's made along the way. So please do enjoy the talk. I'm, I'm looking forward to um, um, hearing what Catherine's got to say and make sure you ask plenty of awkward um, questions at the end. Um, uh, and we'll now um, just going to watch a brief housekeeping uh, presentation before Alex um, will step up and, and do the detailed um, introduction for Catherine. Thank you. So you know when you want to watch a movie and you can't because it's this constant stream of... Uh, uh, opening credits, you know, that one after the other. So this is one of those moments, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm another one of those, I'm afraid, sorry. And uh, my name is Alex Origi, I'm one of the professors in the School of Art and Architecture. And, uh, and I've been knowing Catherine, uh, and I mean, I have the, 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 the privilege to introduce Catherine to you tonight. So I've been knowing Catherine, and Catherine and I have been knowing each other for about 16 years. And uh, we, yes, <laughs> that's true, <laughs> I'm afraid. And uh, we met in 2007 at the University of Edinburgh at the conference. I was working at the University of Newcastle and Catherine was working in Germany at Weimar uh, and Bauhaus and, uh, in Weimar. And at that time, I was, I was editing a book uh, on uh, augmented urban spaces. And the book was coming along okay. But when I heard Catherine's presentation, the second day of the conference, I thought, I really need this lady in. You know, I, I really need a, a, a chapter from her. And so I kind of approached her and asked, invited her to write a chapter, which she did very kindly. And it was a really strong chapter on places, situations and connections. That was the title of it uh, in that book. Uh, her work at that time then generated, of course, more things for more interesting things for Catherine herself so she did two edited books and uh, uh, and a monograph uh, called net spaces which came out in 2015 and uh, and it's a really good book and and which i strongly recommend i've quoted it many times <laughs> and anyway i mean we kept in touch and interestingly you know and i was really delighted to receive uh, an application, job application from, from her to join Plymouth, in, uh, uh, which she then did in 2011. And uh, Catherine looks at the intersection between digital technologies and the spaces that support interaction, aggregation and togetherness, and how we use our spaces, how we socialize, and what technology can do for communities and for the social spaces where communities exist. And she, had look, she has looked at the intersection of technology and community centres, for instance, or local library schools, and even open environments like parks 
uh, recently in a, in a big EU project here, based here in Plymouth. And I suppose that most people in the room are probably familiar, at least those who know Catherine and, and her work, are probably familiar with the local and regional projects that Catherine has undertaken. And for instance, her work with British Telecom and Superfast Broadband in Cornwall, and the subsequent work on uh, local inclusion in, in network communities and digital neighborhoods. And her involvement ongoing, and uh, actually it's just finished, right, the project, with the project called Green Minds and the consortium and the digital side of that project. And, um, and the uh, collaboration with Nudge Community Builders mm -hmm on Stonehouse and the Community Renewal Fund here in Plymouth, and, uh, and as well the collaboration with Plymouth City Council on the Living Lab, lab here in the university on the e-bikes, on the recent kind of uh, mobility hubs uh, type of installations, and more, uh, but I've only, I've only, I'm only mentioning these ones. And, but beyond these, you know, so beyond local Catherine, or regional Catherine, <laughs> uh, there is something which is even more important in a way, which is Global Catherine. And, 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 and Global Catherine is a very important side of, of our speaker's work, uh, you know, because our contribution even here in the region could not be as strong as it is without the basis of a really impressive intellectual input into the field globally and the development of a world-renowned profile uh, based on international networking and publishing and some examples of Global Catherine, which, uh, you know, are uh, her engagements with intercontinental research networks, with colleagues in Europe, South America, Africa, Australia, and Asia, and of which, uh, um, which also has included two funded Newton networks, and particularly I'd like to mention the AHRC-funded network called Who's Right to the Smart City, and which involved Brazilian, Nigerian, and Indian partners, of, on, of course, on top of UK uh, colleagues. And the work she's doing with the International Telecommunication Union, uh, the ITU, on enabling people-centered cities through digital transformation, and her active involvement in various editions of the Media Architecture Biennale, the MAB, and in Germany, Australia, China, and the Netherlands, and, uh, and of course, a wide range of world-class world publications. So she did not stop at the Net Spaces book, which nevertheless I recommend. And, but uh, she has produced two further uh, very prominent volumes for Rutledge and a monograph called Digital and Smart Cities and the companion and the edited companion to Smart Cities, which gathers together some of the most prominent uh, uh, global experts in the field, you know, from across the world. And all of this has consolidated her reputation in the field. So I'm not going to bore you further, but uh, I think for all these reasons, I think we can expect a talk which will be both kind of enjoyable, but also in, 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 in Catherine uh, Willis's style, quite thought provoking. And, uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to it. So so let me leave you to, to the talk, to this talk on smart cities and communities and the future of connected neighborhoods and call to the lectern uh, Professor Catherine Willis. Um, well, so thank you for those kind introductions. I'm not quite sure imagining what a global Catherine is. That's a bit scary, but uh, <laughs> so imagine it's some sort of balloon or something. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk to you today about the topic of smart cities and communities um, and with the sort of broader sec sort of thinking around what might be the future of connected neighbourhoods. Um, so many of you may or may not know uh, what the topic of smart cities is. Hopefully I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into that, but I'm also going to talk about some of the more broader thematics. Um, I've got a very large QR code here, so I've, if, if anybody wants to um, read the, the transcript of the talk while I'm talking and if they have problems with slides, um, you can download it here. So you're welcome to do that if you're either online or um, in the room. Um, so these are the sort of things hopefully we're going to do as takeaways today. I'm going to test you at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk about 
what are smart cities? Because I think that's a question often people ask, because we don't necessarily assume what that means. Um, but I'm going to talk about some sort of broader ideas about why we think about technology in the world in which we live, and I'm going to argue that it's um, socially and spatially constructed. Um, and I'm going to, often when we talk about technology, I'll get someone who, and many people, who quite rightly sort of argue about the way that technology takes us away from the place and the space that we're in, that somehow being on the phone makes us not hear, or how it stops us being connected to people. I'm going to argue the opposite. I'm going to argue how technology or the digital world can also connect us to place and space. And I think that's some of the sort of key thinking I've got in the work that I do. And then I'm going to sort of talk a little bit more around this idea of what might be connected neighbourhoods and talk about how can smart cities support placemaking in neighbourhoods, thinking about some of that broader ideas around place and placemaking that we're developing in the faculty. So first of all, I had a bit of a panic last week and I was like, oh gosh, I've got to write the talk. So um, we were having a discussion actually at the Placemaking Institute and someone mentioned ChatGPT, so I thought, right, let's see what it comes up with. Um, so I asked it, um, if anybody knows ChatGPT, it's a, um, a chatbot that enables you, it's, it's been in the news a lot and it's basically what we call artificial intelligence, so machine learning, it's a language generator, sources large uh, models of, of work that exist in the world and, and takes out knowledge from it. And there's a big debate about whether AI is going to take over the world. Um, so I asked it to write me a, a lecture. Um, the good news is it wasn't that great. Uh, <laughs> the bad news is, is when I asked it to make it, I tried various different questions because obviously it's a, it, is, it is me deciding how the, the information that comes out. It's not, it's not the, the, it isn't inherently based in the machine. Me and the machine are working together. Um, but I asked it to make it fun and interesting. So the bad news is it was probably more interesting than me when it came out with it. So when it's more fun and interesting model. But um, what, we, what it did come up with is some really sort of generic. And one of the challenges with the smart cities field is um, there's many interpretations of it. Um, and some of the, the work is, is very what we will call techno-deterministic. And it sort of imagines this, this world defined by technology. Um, and what I'd like to do is talk to you today about how, like I talked about, technology is socially constructed but also how we can start to rethink some of the, the models that, that ChatGPT came up with when it trawled the internet to find out about what smart cities were into ones that are not defining this very sort of system model um, approach to where we're all living in, in bubbles and uh, commuting around in, um, in high-tech um, systems. So um, Alex mentioned this book. Um, this, this book was my, my sort of plea to, to think about space and place in a, what I call a network world. Um, I don't think I was great at networking because I'm not sure Alex is kind, but I'm not sure many people read it. But anyway, I think it's an important book. <laughs> There's some later stuff which has been much more widely read. But basically, um, hopefully what I tried to establish, and it was, it's, it's fairly original in the field, is the idea that technology has a place and is and we talked about and, and we have the networks of connectivity and digital world. And rather than disconnecting ourselves from place with technology, actually it can reconnect. Um, and that's sort of quite fundamentally different to some of the ways that we think about the ways that some of the fields we're in. Um, sort of, I originally come from the field of architecture, but I've sort of moved around computer science, sociology, urban studies, media studies. I've been sort of tried to find the, the, my own place in those spaces. Um, so there's a growing awareness in the fields of design and architecture about the um, effects of the way that technology affects the way we, we, we live in urban space. And we've got this emergence of smart cities, um, something called Internet of Things, and they've highlighted the correction between, so ICTs are information and communication technologies, and the city. So what I try to argue, and that's sort of some of the core thinking that, that hopefully we'll, we'll talk about today, is that networks are about the city. They don't result in these non-places, that's a term that means you know, airports and these places that are sort of the global global spaces where you don't quite know if you're in one city or another. In fact, they, they can result in meaningful and high quality spaces. Um, and that's not just you know, a nice idea, but it, it's part of an actual quite a big change in how we inhabit and experience other spaces around us and for how we design cities. Um, and to some extent, things like COVID have shown us what that means. So I'm gonna talk to you today um, about uh, three different levels of way of thinking about the urban space. So we're gonna start with the spatial. Um, and I'm going to, like I said, I've talked about those, um, those three ideas that I'd like to, to sort of bring across to you today. And I'm also going to use some examples um, from three cities to try and sort of illustrate my point. But so before we go, um, having sort of talked to you about technology and cities and space, 
um, I'm actually going to step back. Um, and we're going to step back into some more underpinning urban theory. We're going to leave the technology behind for the moment, and we're going to go to 555 Hudson Street. Um, so this is in Greenwich Village in New York. Um, and this is, this is a more modern photograph. This is, this is the, the year I want to go back to, the 1950s or 1960. So this is the home of um, an urbanist called Jane Jacobs, who is one of the sort of leading, or has become one of the leading thinkers for how we think about how we inhabit and how we design our urban space. So Jacobs was, a, was actually a journalist. Um, she lived in this, in this neighborhood in, in, um, in Greenwich Village in New York, which back then was, was a much poorer and sort of more diverse neighborhood, become quite gentrified now. Um, and she sort of became very, you know, she, she watched the neighborhood around her and she was quite involved in it. Um, but uh, it became a sort of site of uh, really where sort of a new approach to urban theory emerged. So we have um, in, in, urban, in urban thinking, a lot of our urban theory emerged in the early 1900s when we started to um, have uh, the world was, was urbanized. We started to have these more in, uh, sort of large scale industrial urban centers. Um, and we created these sort of complex urban spaces. Um, Jane Jacobs started to, to argue for a, another way of understanding the cities around us. So the reason she did this was because um, back in the late 50s, Robert Moses, who was the, the chief planner for um, New York City, uh, had this, this big master plan. It was a sort of example of what we call sort of top-down or modernist urban planning, you know, the key idea about how we're going to create a new vision for the city. And this vision for the city was this expressway that was going to pass through New York and create a new model of how the city would work. So you can see this is a top-down view. You have this large-scale infrastructure. All the ways in which we think about the way that we think the city, the sort of urban planning and, and city making um, that emerged over the last sort of 40, 50 years was sort of exemplified in this idea from Moses. Um, the challenge was that um, while it was promising this, this modernist vision of how we would live in the future, you know, moving around um, through using cars and the sort of heightened mobility, um, what it actually was going to do was to, was to go through Jake, Jane Jacobs' neighbourhood. So 555 Hudson Street is somewhere in the middle there and would no longer exist. So Jane Jacobs didn't start off as an urbanist. She started off as like, a journalist who lived in a space, but she became involved in a sort of battle, this sort of metaphorical and literal battle for the city. Um, and so Jane Jacobs um, was arguing about the fact that we needed to preserve the space in which she lived. Uh, which was this um, Hudson Street or the Greenwich Village neighbourhood. Um, and she sort of argued about it in a way that sort of involved um, lots of ways of thinking about the city, which were, were different from the way we have now. So this is Washington Square Park. Um, this was the main park that the, the, the um, this expressway was going to go through. It was not only just go through the neighbourhood, but it was specifically wipe out this park. Um, so this park, you know, again, Parks we often think about in the Western sense, you know, they're, they're sort of just there. But actually parks are really important parts of our, of our social infrastructure, of the public space. They're public accessible, they're places open to anyone, and they're places where people can come together. We call them maybe the commons or the space of, of, of coming together. And in fact, Washington Square Park was exactly that. So this is a few years later. Oh, given my given it away now. It didn't, she didn't win. She won, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but this became actually a, a site of, of, of real um, social activity, one of the sort of political and social centres of New York where beatniks came and it became a, a really important space for people to come together. But what J.K. should do was argued that parks, uh, streets, side, she called them sidewalks, so pavements, um, the, the, the sociality of the urban space was actually what urbanity was. So when we think about top-down sort of modernist urban theory, this infrastructural idea and the idea of the city as the buildings, you know, the built space and the infrastructure and all those ways in which it's the, the buildings and the spaces and the material world that is the, the city. Jane Jacobs provided the opposite and argued that this was what made cities. This was a cityness. So people inhabiting the space, particularly where you have the space in between, so the public realm or the commons, um, the place where people can be, anyone has access. So actually it was the, the social space of the city that, that Jane Jacobs argued was the city. And this was quite radical back in the 50s because the built environment was a city. You know, we, they, people understood it that way and they, they make it that way. So to understand the city as the space in between, as soft, as social and, and people, and Jane Jacobs talked about togetherness. 
um, she was um, very much got this idea that the city was about um, the, the way that people worked together and, and came together and um, did things. So I'm just going to read a little bit of a text from Jane Jacobs about how... So one of the ways she, she understood the idea of sitting was not from, um, again, sort of abstract representations, but from observing the space in which she lived, the small-scale neighbourhood of um, Greenwich Village. So this is Jane Jacobs' observation in her book, Death and Life of American Cities. While I sweep up the wrappers, I watch the other rituals of the morning. Mr. Halpert unlocking the laundry's handcart from its morning, mooring to a cellar door. Joe Cornacci's son-in-law stacking out the empty crates in the delicatessen. The barber bringing out his sidewalk folding chair. Mr. Goldstein arranging the coils of wire which proclaim the hardware store is open. The wife of the tenement superintendent depositing a chunky three-year-old with a toy mandolin on the stoop. The vantage point from which he's learned the English his mother cannot speak. Now the primary children heading for St. Luke's dribble through to the south. The children for Sir Veronica's Cross heading to the west. Two new entrances are being made from the wings. Well-dressed and even elegant women and men with briefcases emerge from doorways and side streets. So you can sort of see, and she talks about this as a sidewalk ballet, and this is the, the sort of cityness. Um, but she also talks about how those people are also sort of custodians of that space, and they create what she calls a sort of sense of togetherness. Um, now, in terms of togetherness, um, she, we, we've talked, we've talk, I'm going to introduce this idea of something called social infrastructure, so the parks, the streets, the, the, um, the, the spaces in which the society, our society comes together. Um, and that's really what gives a cohesiveness, and we create something we might call social capital. And social capital is the degree of a community to be able to respond to change, be able to make changes, and also to be able to deal with difference, so to be able to respond to a diversity of uses. And that's something I'll come back to later. So thinking about the city as social infrastructure and not this idea of technical or, or um, physical infrastructure like, like we saw with that expressway. So the other part, the thing that Jane Jacobs do, which was a sort of fundamental difference to um, the way we think about urban, urban theory, was she involved local people who became involved in the fight or the, what we call the right to the city. I mean, we have um, some, some work that's developed out of not necessarily Jane Jacobs' work, but the idea that people have the right to the city, the right to the, the urban space, and they have a right to be involved in how it's developed. That sort of comes out of Lefebvrean and sort of work by Neil Brenner that thinks about the right to the city as a right to, right to the commons, the right to, to, be, to be present in your own space. Um, so one of the other things you do was sort of create a whole, a whole sort of level of activism around campaigning for their, their own people to choose what happened in their urban space. Um, so they had, you know, no road through our home. And again, you know, it wasn't, there was a, there was a much different sort of power uh, dynamic in, in the sort of cities of that time where urban planners were actually sort of, you know, very, very powerful um, p parts of how cities got changed. And ch championing against them was quite difficult. So the fact that she managed to mobilise a whole neighbourhood um, and come together and sort of bring in local people who weren't experts, who didn't, didn't have any knowledge, and to sort of create a counter movement was that idea of um, how we might sort of also see the value of the social as part of the spatial. So, like I said, the, the good news was that um, Jane Jacobs won. Um, she, she, uh, the, the, the road was not built. Washington Square Park is still there. And it, like I said, it became a site of... Um, of, of real sort of importance in the city in terms of politics and the sort of societal implications of people coming together, part of some of the key social movements that have formed New York City. So this little fight, this fight for the neighbourhood and the fight for the park as a place of difference and a place that could be valued, um, you know, has, was, was not inconsequential. So, but, but this idea, and again, this is quite you know, it was quite radical in urban theory. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have thought that the street, she talked a lot about the value of people keeping eyes on us on the street. You wouldn't have thought that those things were actually part of what would constitute a city. But she argued that we need to understand and understand thoroughly specific places. So rather than this sort of global context and this aspiration for a vision of a sort of utopian city, which would solve all the problems, she said we need to be in these, these specific places. And she also talked about the fact that um, it's the... Is the, uh, there's no logic that can be imposed on the city. People make it, and it is to them, not buildings, that we must fit our plans. So again, the idea that the, the city, the city could be made of people, the people constructed the city, was quite radical. So this is the idea about how 
place and space are socially constructed. I mean, we, we have buildings and we have the built world around us, but actually it's the spaces in between and the way that people appropriate and make sense of those spaces are often the way that we understand the city. But it also was a little bit about how cities are also um, sites of difference. They're chaotic. They don't. They don't. They aren't utopian and vision. They aren't. They aren't the sort of perfect spaces. They're, some of them are. The, the value of what we have is uh, is that social of the the people coming out in the morning and maybe you know kids screaming and that 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 chaos that incompleteness is what she argued is cityness. Um, so again, th the idea that we can think about cities as socially constructed as well as spatially constructed. And that was really, again, like I've mentioned, quite radical in the way we think about architecture and urban space. It's not based on aesthetics or the physical built space of the city, but how people shape it, how people make sense of it. And those intangible and social qualities of place are Gaga socially constructed, so defined by people rather than by architects and urban planners. So here we go. Oh, there we go. This is, the, this is Washington Square Park today. Um, and another way in which we started to see this idea of social infrastructure as the building blocks of place is Oldenburg's idea of third place. So when we have, um, which has got some similar sort of thinking to Jane Jacobs, although they weren't at the time working together. Um, so Oldenburg came up with this idea of third place where home is the th first place, work is the second place, and third place is all these inconsequential in-between places that we sort of don't really think about as cityness. So cafes, libraries, parks, um, uh, hairdressers, he mentions, sports places. These are the places that people come together and actually are sort of part of what we might call social capital. So they're the ability of us to work together as a society. And like I said, are openly accessible to, to everyone. Um, and, and that part of that thinking about third places, you know, post offices, streets, parks, pavements, they're, they're just as valuable in terms of their physical quality of the space. And there's, there's this idea of these social infrastructures linking those together. And that comes again to this idea of, of neighbourhood and how neighbourhood can be seen as a sort of um, creating that important context of third place outside that, that first place of home and that second place of, of work. So again, this was quite radical thinking. This is all back in the 50s and 60s. At the time, although Jane Jacobs won her fight and The Death and Life of American Cities became quite a key book, it's really taken 50, 60 years for it really is still, you know, it's still present in the way we think and some of the ways we, um, the, the sort of ways that urban space is generated these days is very much um, based in some of this, in this thinking. So it's, it's dated, but it's still very relevant. So this is the, the Mayor of London um, report talking about the value of social infrastructure. And what you can see here is some, some, some very similar, some sort of common similarities in the language about the way they talk about the social space of the city being the thing that they value in terms of urban development in the city of London. So good social infrastructures consist of an ecosystem of publicly funded services and the voluntary community and private sector. Moreover, it's not just the buildings and open spaces or even institutions, but also the connections between people and indeed organisations that makes a good place. Many of these happen in informal settings, from cafes to barbershops, community centres and sports and exercise facilities. So again, is the cafe the space of the city? Part of this would argue that that is, is because it's commonly accessible, um, it's open to all, and it's where people come together to do the social business of, of the urban space. So, you've been wondering, when are you going to start talking about smart cities? <laughs> is it going to be there? Um, so I'm now going to come on and think about some of those ideas about how they might be interpreted in the way we think about smart cities. I sort of introduce some of those building blocks of what we might call neighbourhood design, social infrastructure and third places. And I've looked at how the sort of technocratic and top down master planning has ignored those, those qualities and seen city development as infrastructural. So how does this link to smart cities? So I'm going to think about how technology is also socially constructed. So we saw how place is socially constructed is some of the ways um, and sort of counter it with thinking around how smart cities might also be um, socially and spatially constructed. Or maybe I'm not. Oh. Um, so the first thing to sort of highlight is um, there is no common definition of a smart city. It's a term that's emerged in the last sort of 15 years. And it's really quite, quite dynamic and tends to be appropriated by different people for different means. So it originally emerged um, 
as a term, in fact, developed by IBM to talk about the way that it was going to change the way that it delivered its, uh, its, its projects and thought about cities as a new way to think about how computing could be delivered in a, in a spatial context. So it was taking the, the computer out of the, the room and putting it in the city. Um, so it was started really with a, a sort of appropriation in itself. Um, and I so said, Alex was, didn't mention that the books that we wrote were actually co-edited. So this was a book where we sought to define what, what the smart city was and also show how it came out of um, a long sort of heritage. You know, the smart city emerged as a term fairly recently, but it, it sits in a long heritage of how we think about technology and the city and digital. So this is, a, this is not the definition, but this is a definition that we work with and we think helps define that, that sort of different, different aspects of the city. It's not the chat GPT one. Um, so the smart city is defined by city systems that are connected through information and data changes in the process in which cities are monitored, managed and analysed. So there is a, a data and an information layer. But it's also characterised by new digital services and interfaces which see a shift in how citizens participate, interact with the city and inhabit its spaces so new forms of urban governance and citizenship. And this is something that's often a little bit lost in how we talk about smart cities. We focus on the technology, but one of the ways that we argue is it creates new models of how we inhabit the urban spaces around us and new models of how we participate and enact sort of citizenship or governance, so how, we, how the city is managed or, or, or looked after. Um, one of the ways that um, it's been talked about, which maybe helps to sort of think through, we're talking about the, the ways that AI are talked about, is um, Shepard defined this idea the city as sentient. So we're starting to think about the, the built space around us um, when it's embedded with some of the technologies as having some sort of idea of agency. It starts to be able to, to have a, a way in which it starts to maybe not think for itself, but be connected and en enabled. Um, th that may or may not be good good or bad, but I think the idea about thinking around uh, the, the spatial world around us being connected through data and how that starts to create a new way in which we engage with it um, is, is one of the things. And um, Shepard talks about how prediction, so one of the ways we often experience the urban space is it's fixed. You know, if you've ever come to that point where you um, turn the corner and there's a new building and suddenly you're like, gosh, the city's changed. You know, that's the point we realise that most of the time we're, we're used to the the built space around us being fairly a, you know, atemporal, it's like it's solid and it doesn't move. But the sentient city is something that puts a new sort of layer of dynamism in the city and makes some of that materiality a slightly more alive. Um, and and Shepard also talks about this idea of data. So the data clouds of the 21st century are now more important than the formal organisation of space and material in shaping our experience of the city. Smart technologies are transforming how we see and interact with the city. This demands not only a reconsideration of, oh, not the role, the role of architects and the profession of architecture, but also a radical rethink of cities and indeed citizens. So again, we're thinking about the fact how this is not just a sort of inconsequential, you know, we've got buttons that we can press and something lights up, but actually it does change the, some of our relationships with urban space. And again, we'll talk about whether that's good or bad, but um, I think that, that the way that technology has shaped our urban space has always resulted in, in fundamental changes in how we inhabit it as well. If we think about it being um, shaped by technology, it was, we are also shaping it. Ah, so... We're going to go to another street now. So this is a, this is a street in, um, in India, in Chennai. Um, and the reason we're in this street, so this is, this is a, 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 a street that's socially, there's, there's a, lots going on. It's known in, um, in Chennai as one of the busiest streets and sort of in urban, I was told in urban myth that it's one of the busiest streets in the world. Um, so. Raghunathan Street in Chennai is this, this, uh, this, this great space of urbanity, a social space um, that's inhabited by all these different people. But um, Raghunathan Street was also the site of one of the um, Indian smart city projects. So back in um, 2015, I think, India championed one of the largest um, smart city projects. Um, it was 100 smart cities, a smart cities mission. And Inagar, or the district which we see here, was the site of this, of, of the, the smart city project. So we had a, um, we, were, we were, I'll talk to you a minute about the project we do, but if you can just put yourself in the space of this street, um, there's informal traders. There are some formal shops, but a lot of the space in this street is being 
um, it's, all, it's very dynamic. It's sort of happening all the time. There's, pe you know, there's lots of people. There's rickshaw drivers. There's uh, people moving through, making shopping, people meeting. It's a really dynamic urban space. And um, some of the ways that this space has been characterized is as a problem. As, as, so there's, a, there's the infrastructure in, in Chennai, um, particularly in Tinagar, there's a problem with the infrastructure in terms of uh, sanitation, in terms of flooding, in terms of like, access to energy. All the sort of infrastructural things are seen as problematic, and this space is seen with this, uh, this sort of mass of people moving around is seen as, as being, being problematic. So one of the ways that um, the, uh, the Indian government, so this is the Smart Cities uh, mission in, in India, was one of the largest globally Smart Cities projects, of quite top down, so led by the, the Modi government, originally sort of championed by Modi before he, um, he moved into his role as, as prime minister but in Pune, he tr tried it out um, in Gujarat. Um, so the Smart City projects aim to have 100 Smart Cities um, and was a large, large investment. And like I said, Tinagar was one of the, the cities that was selected in Chennai as the, the site of the Smart City. So it's another neighbourhood, uh, Tinagar. So the, uh, the Smart Cities mission was basically a sort of pitching exercise by Indian, smart city, Indian cities and they pitched for large sort of amounts of money from the, from the Indian government to, to create a smart city in their own city. Um, and Tinagar, which is this district here, and Raghunathan Street is the street off to the, to the left, um, was one of the things that pitched up to, to, to create a smart city plan. Um, so I said it was a, the, the densest shopping district, a really sort of vibrant space, um, but it was seen as a problem. Um, and they wanted to, 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 to create a solution which was, um, was smart. So they were going to have smart bus and e-rickshaw feeders, solid waste management, water supply management, sewage management and storm water management, including a flood water and monitoring system. So, you know, lots of things to help solve the problems of this urban space. Um, you know, some of this was seen as, as slum or, or informal, informal neighbourhoods. And again, lots of, um, lots, of, lots of people inhabit that space that may be part, not part of the formal economy. So smart city projects can, can take all sorts of form. And we can argue, in fact, whether this was indeed a smart city project because it was quite problematic in some of the ways that um, it was doing that. So the reason um, I showed you the picture is because we got an AHRC project to look at um, smart city projects around the world and try and understand what that meant for the people, for the social aspect of the city. Um, so we, we called it Who's Right to the Smart City? And we were looking at... Um, some of the ways in which people were maybe um, ch sort of championing or fighting back against smart city projects that weren't delivering the smart city in a people-centric or a place-based way. Because one of the challenges with um, some of these smart city projects is they don't really understand those specific places of Jacobs. So the way we did this, um, so this was a project where we went in and, and worked with local people. Um, we identified um, a series of stakeholders. There was, a, there was a, an activist organisation in Chennai who were our core partner and linked us up with a whole range of stakeholders who were involved in the smart city project, but not part of the government plans. So we did some mapping in the city space. We've got architects and planners, um, some industry people, people from the local government and local community organisations. And we started to understand in the space how the smart city would land in that specific place. So we, we mapped out, you can sort of see, and then we discussed those things. So we started to think about whose city was being smart, whose, whose city was smart. Um, and some of the interesting things we found were there were lots of actual examples of smart in the space that the Indian government hadn't highlighted. So smartness was there, but uh, the, 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 the top-down approach was really not necessarily do doing the, the, best, um, the best job. So um, this is just some of the sort of Twitter feeds. So um, we had various workshops, like we involved a whole lot of stakeholders. We interrogated all the smart city policy documents to try and understand what the reality of the smart city was and how it would be delivered. Um, and we had, like I said, stakeholders from the city there to try and understand that. And one of these was um, uh, the, 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 the gentleman here, who was the, the lead for the Street Hawks Association, which um, myself, coming from a Western background, I hadn't really understood like quite how powerful that was. But in the break, he told me he had 40 million members. <laughs> and so this was you know, one of the most sort of powerful organisations for the informal economy, because the informal economy is the economy, uh, not is, but is a very powerful economy in, um, in the Indian space. And those were the people in the street. Um, and what we saw with the Smart City Project is actually it was going to remove those people from the seat because they were seen as a problem. They were a problem that would need to be replaced by better infrastructure and quite a westernised model of what the Smart City would be that 
really lacked any understanding about what the value of the space was. So we think about the way that Jane Jacobs would have valued that space. She would have gone, well, look at the richness and the value of those connections, the, the, the way that people are working together, um, how it's overcoming difference, how there's equal access, all of those things. Obviously, I'm not um, downplaying the challenges of uh, a, a global majority city and some of those infrastructural problems and the poverty, you know, all those things. But um, in terms of the cityness, it, that problem is maybe not quite as, as extreme. So um, we sort of developed some, some models for, for sort of identifying how the city was already smart in many ways, but also how we needed to um, think about the role of citizenship and governance and how people were involved in their decision making around the smart city and how they might have different models of the smart city. Um, and this wasn't... Um, bit of a delay. This wasn't um, as a result of what we did, but there was this really interesting... You know, we, if we saw the banners that the, the neighbours, the neighbourhood in um, Jane Jacobs thing came up. So they had a banner. And if you can look, they wanted, we want bread and butter, not smart city. So they, they saw that their livelihood was being, was being affected by the smart city project. And actually they were championing against it. Um, we were looking at also how there might be alternative models of the smart city. But for them, the smart city was about a displacement exercise and they were going to be moved from the urban space. It was going to be sanitised and they were going to move to a market space, which was elsewhere, which they didn't have access, which was probably not going to have much access for the local people. And some of the other aspects of it were all about taking out the value and the sociality of that space and moving it somewhere and, and actually you know, taking away the, 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 the benefits of that urban space. So the street hawkers protested and like I said we were part of that conversation about them understanding and hopefully giving them the right to understanding what the smart city was around how they would start to appropriate the city for their own benefits and, and be citizens of that space. So we developed some materials and reports around what smart citizenship might mean um, in that context um, working with the local partners um, so we sort of tried to sort of set this new agenda for smart city governance um, that, that reports on the website and that sort of has generated um, some, some other, will help to sort of contribute to the debate around how we might start to think about other ways around how smart cities involve local people and who who's, who's has the right to the smart city. Um, and particularly thinking about this idea of citizenship and governance and agency and how people, so one of the things that we really saw was that actually smart cities should be for the informal traders, for those people who are in the street and not for some sort of quite um, highly sort of mobile um, elite that was actually going to benefit because they had access to some of these technologies and would be, you know, we, we saw things like um, a lot of the technology being, being brought in was developed in MIT and was sort of being dropped, dropped into to the Chennai context without an understanding about what the real needs were. So we started to argue also that the people, the people of the smart city should be a different set of people and it should be the most excluded, those from the more informal, informal tr traders, you know, like the street traders that we saw or um, those who, you know, maybe rickshaw drivers and, and so on. So we took that back um, and I think that sort of, we took that back to London and sort of championed that work um, with trying to sort of inform some of the other um, smart city plans that have happened. The other partner was, was Brazil, so we championed some of that work in Brazil and then it was featured in um, the, uh, the HRC sort of summary of how arts and humanities research address complex challenges facing communities and um, they had to sort of make a section for technology because it hadn't been part of what they did. So luckily we sort of got a space where they started to see technology and addressing issues of inclusion and citizenship in smart cities was something that's part of how we look at the urban space and, and good critical research. So this type of approach is central to, to much of the smart city agenda where the, where the city, you know, we, we saw in, in, in India and, the, and the, the smart cities mission, they saw the city as a problem and the solution would be to solve it with technology, to drop some technology. They were one of the, the, um, the, t the technologies which I, you know, they were going to deliver in the, was a, a set of RFID sensors to be put on rubbish bins that would somehow magically solve the problem of informal waste collection. Um, and again, was a was a Western developed MIT project that had failed in the West and was being sort of shipped to, to, the, to, to the global majority because that was, you know, there was seen to be a market there. So, and it had no understanding of the local place, the local people and who was going to be involved because that was going to displace quite a lot of local people who um, worked in that space. And that's sort of central to a lot of smart city agendas where technology, the city is a problem and technology is the solution. And it gives very little sort of understanding to what Sasson has called the incompleteness of cities or a sort of place-based and um, citizen-centric approach to smart cities. Um, 
So what uh, Sasson talks about ha is um, how it hasn't sort of, the technology has not been urbanized. Um, our cities tend to be, um, tend to urbanize technologies, you know, how technology, how we socially construct technology. And this opens up a whole field for research and interpretation, invites us to reposition Western notions of urbanity and um, uh, building technologies in urban space. And she also talks about this idea of open source urbanism, which is starting to think about another way in which um, the city might be understood in the way that technology does. And she talks about this idea of the park, I think not just being hardware, but the software of people's practices. So the challenge we identified in Chennai is one that's played out in other smart city initiatives globally. And there's much critical research on sort of failed smart city agendas. The WHO Smart City Project identified the need to empower local people at a place-based level and to develop smart city project for themselves. In fact, it repeats many of the same tropes that we saw in the battle between the modernist urban master planning and the bottom-up localised placemaking from Jacobs. From the research, we realised the need to address bottom-up and inclusive smart cities and recognise the role of local places and people and sought to empower them to develop smart cities for themselves. Um, and that's been matched by a shift in the whole smart city project. So, um, the sort of UN has started to sort of champion other visions of smart city where they call the people centric see people centered smart city. So we've seen this shift from these very top down deterministic um, infrastructural smart city projects to ones that recognize the role of people and place and, and where we might argue that we see technology as socially constructed and not um, the city as technology constructed. So um, the UN Habitat has this, these reports, and as Alex mentioned, I'm part of some of the ITU work around this rethinking sort of policy guidance and thinking around what the strategy for smart cities are. Um, so it needs to include public participation, education, public health, data governance and digital inclusion. And these concepts centred more on government services rather than infrastructure and emphasise technology's role in enhancing citizen engagement through things like crowdsourcing, open data, citizen science, civic technology and social media. And that's something we've talked about in, our, in the book, again, about how we start to see cities not just as the built, the, the, the technology and how it's defined, but also how it's inhabited by people. So I've given you a rather dystopian, you know, the smart city that has, has, has been topped, you know, the, the expressway through the existing space. So we're going to now look at a project which is hopefully a bit more of a positive vision of a smart city. So we're going to another street now. Um, this is Radhustraat in, in Amsterdam, in a sort of northern district of Amsterdam. Um, and it's been one of the, it's a, a local neighbourhood. Um, it's, uh, you know, people are on the street. The good thing about Amsterdam is there's more, more bikes and cars. Um, and it's also been the site of a sort of set of projects which have been testing out sort of a people-centred smart city approach where democracy and, and civic governance are sort of key, key parts of that approach. Um, so they've been working um, in a project called Hollander St. Lutchen or Dutch Skies, which takes up um, a challenge which was developed from local citizens around what they wanted to do in their neighbourhood. And one of the things they were, that this neighbourhood um, was experiencing was there was a Tartar steel factory nearby and there was issues of air pollution and the quality of the urban space. And they wanted to be able to, the local people wanted to be able to have some way to uh, be to have a say in how that was affecting their own their neighbourhood, how that particular place was being affected. So they developed a whole set of open source air quality sensors, um, which were um, low cost, um, fairly easy to do, were, were embedded within the neighbourhood in different. So each of these people who live in the neighbourhood who had no technical expertise would take these sensors and would use them to help to sort of gather data around the air quality in that space and how that would um, help to um, sort of give them advocacy and, and, like I said, a right to the city. Um, so we've got that, that open source sensor there, use models of sort of things like citizen science and quite simplistic technology, nothing that was sort of, you know, that basically people can use for themselves. <coughs> and they developed kits. <coughs> so this actually came out of work in a Barcelona, but was, was delivered partly in Amsterdam. Um, the Smart Citizen Kit was a sort of set of low-cost sensors that were being delivered to local people and they could use for themselves and there were dashboards to enable them to do that. Um, and again, we have um, here 
different ways about thinking about data where it's not locked in and used to sort of control things, but enables people to make decisions <coughs> and to see how their, their data is part of a, a broader set, so sort of crowd sharing data, um, and, and enables them to sort of have a hold a position in, in the conversation with some of the more uh, key players in the government sector. Um, so another way they did this was, uh, so you've had these, these open source sensors, you have um, new ways about having open data where it's crowdsourced and easily accessed. You also had a whole lot of co-production and co-design and people working locally, creating cross-sectoral partnerships, but also talking to local people, understanding the challenge from the bottom up, um, and then using that to, to advocate. So involving local stakeholders from the government, civic sector and third sector, but like I said, through a co-design approach, so working together. So the challenge came from the local people and not from what the problems were in the city. The, the city is a problem in itself, but where they wanted to address a problem and do that at a local level, at a neighbourhood level. Um, and again, it involved multiple stakeholders. So this wasn't a, a government-led or an industry-led initiative, but multiple partners. And there's a sort of key role for the VARG, so VARG is a sort of civic sector organisation that's been doing work, really one of the key founders of probably the digital city movement, um, where they started to look at the way that digital creates new models of governance and um, engagement. So they talk about smart citizenship as a way to empower people to be involved in their local, local decision making and to make changes in the, um, the quality of life for themselves. And a way to sort of create self-determination um, and create new types of social organisation and collaborative decision making. So this is, this is coming back to what we might think of how when we embed digital in the social infrastructure, how, how we can start to, to make change. And how it takes up the logic of the commons. So I was just going to mention um, some of the elements. We've, talk, we've seen the elements in the Amsterdam example. Um, so I'm just going to mention some of the elements of the smart city. So we've got open source sensors um, that are easily accessible and, and um, not open to everyone. We've got maker spaces and uh, places where we come together to do co-design and work together where everyone is equal and they have common access. We have free Wi-Fi. We often forget that to enable access to the smart city, people need to have digital access and inclusion is an important part of it. Um, we have connected infrastructures, so here we have mobility, um, energy and power all connected together. We have open data, so in other ways we talked about, we have AI but used in a way that is responding to enabling us to do collectively work with AI. So this is um, an AI that allows us to understand the, di the diversity needs of, sort of di not the diversity, the biodiversity needs of bees and start to create new spaces, public, public spaces for them the open data and also what we call what's called in the sort of smart city world is a quadruple helix so academia industry government and civil society working together and what we see that really works in smart cities is actually a drawing together of multiple partners to solve um, multi multi stake multi stakeholder problems so um, we might start to think about that as a new model of this people centric smart city I don't know if anyone noticed but all those projects were in Plymouth um, Plymouth isn't actually designated as smart city, no one's got large, large amounts of money to do it, but actually I think having done a lot of work globally, we're doing smart really well in the city, and it's something that's a bit of a hidden, I didn't mention the Fab City project as well. So Plymouth is, is quite smart and quite people-centric and quite uh, place-based in the way it does smart city, but it's never been very good about telling that story, and because in fact I think it's been quite genuine in terms of just getting on and doing things that respond to local challenges rather than trying to do some sort of top-down down model of um, thing. So I'm going to talk to you now about this term digital placemaking. This is a sort of not a term that's used that widely in smart city. We've seen the people centric smart city, but I'm going to talk about digital placemaking as another way of thinking about um, how we might define the, the projects that would make the smart city. And I think it's sort of speaking to those ideas about the strengths we have in the faculty around place and placemaking, and also how we might start to think about not just the social, so people-centred, but the spatial. So how do we think about smart cities as place-based as well as socially constructed? So this goes back to some thinking. You remember my Net Spaces book and Horan talked about digital places, this social infrastructure. So when we start to embed the digital, not just in the, 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 the spaces around us, but also in the, in the social infrastructure, if we can merge the, the social and the digital infrastructure, we start to bring some of the benefits we saw from like the Jane Jacobs example with the digital, and we don't have that sort of um, disconnect that we saw in the, the Chennai example. And that, that's also quite radical again in thinking about how we think about the, the, the urban space and thinking about social infrastructure. 
So I wrote about sort of the idea of social infrastructure of the smart city and how that might make them more inclusive. We might start to involve different voices and that can provide a new way to underpin smart cities. So I've been doing some work to try and create some um, a sense of what digital placemaking might mean. I think me and Alex are trying to, you know, it's been an area we've always had a sort of strength with in Plymouth and hopefully we can sort of start to influence the discussion to talk about digital placemaking as what, what, what smart cities might mean if we talk about the place-based nature of smart cities as well as the, the people-centric. So this is a, a definition um, sort of started to develop by enhancing and leveraging the power of place through the combination augmentation of digital capabilities and collectivity. So again, it's seeing place as both socially and, um, social and digital together and working together in a sort of added value sense and not fighting against. Um, it involves improving place opportunities within it and involves a strategic approach that recombines physical place, local communities and access to technology. And the critical role is the effect of the community places that meet community needs and build resilience and overcome inequalities. So we tried to sort of develop some sort of toolbox. Um, and so hopefully now you can see we can put back together those three layers. So we've got the digital layer, maybe the examples we saw in Amsterdam, the social layer, what I'm arguing is that in the Chennai example and in, um, and in Amsterdam, all that value of the social is something that we should, we should value and we can start to, sorry, the, the example in, in Chennai was that the, the, the smart city, the, the smart city 1.0 was destroying some of the value of the social and wasn't working within it. And then we have the spatial. So all the, the shop fronts and the libraries and the food banks, um, we've don't, we haven't really seen those as smart city projects, maker spaces, those, are really where we should be developing our, the smart city. And when we start to bring the, the power of digital, um, digital connectivity to enable us to address some of the, the sort of challenges in our world, that's when we get that, the, the, the linking up and where um, I hope, what I've tried to argue is this is what I would mean by connected neighborhoods. So the neighborhood, if we think about the place-based scale and we link the digital, the social and the spatial together, we can start to create sort of much more transformatory ideas of the city. So we've, like I said, we've been developing some sort of, because um, I found that we can go and talk and we can do the activist work, but unless we create some sort of document, and again, the faculty has been really helpful in supporting some of this work to um, think about how we can advocate for this and speak to some of the policy makers to hopefully make this part of policy making from going, going forward. Because at the moment, you're sort of uh, some of the first people to hear how we're defining this term digital place making and how it's going to be used, hopefully, in sort of smart city thinking going forward. Um, so digital placemaking addresses digital, and, you know, I think the important part is it addresses sort of digital and social exclusion by invest, investing in pre-existing communities and to create integrated and digitally and locally embedded civic infrastructures. So back to our third places, but maybe digitally enabled. And so these are some other components that we could read to it. So um, civic engagement and networks, leveraging, I've talked about the idea of collective intelligence, so that might involve AI, but doing that in a sort of people-centric way, hyperlocal approaches, integrating digital access and skills. So skills is another bit. We've, we're going to have the smart cities. We need people to have the skills to be able to, to inhabit them. Access and creating synergies between digital and economic. So I'm just going to, I was going to briefly talk about the Green Minds project, but really, um, I'm not going to talk about it in detail in the project, you can look at that later, but I'm just going to talk about it because we've been trying to test out some of those ideas. It's in a park. Um, it took me quite a while to figure out the link back to Jacobs and how actually parks are, you know, parks are actually one of the core urban spaces in Plymouth. We're really fortunate and we don't really value them. So parks are sort of a bit unloved, and, but thinking about parks as one of the core places of the commons and if we embed digital in, in them, how does that do? So we're doing lots of co-design. Um, Engaging with local people, particularly with younger people, we found in sort of European context, the most excluded are not the informal economy, they're children and young people. Um, so you remember ChatGPT, Chat where it was, uh, it's being led by OpenAI. Um, we don't know the funding behind it. We don't know what the purpose is. We don't know how it's being created. Um, and it's mainly sort of going to be, you know, it's something that we, we don't have a lot of control over and we can sort of start to appropriate. So we've been one of the small parts of the, of the Dream Minds project has been developing a chatbot that enables us to talk to the park. So we're trying to think about an idea of collective intelligence where we also involve the non-human. So what would happen if the, the park could have a voice? Um, and what would happen if we could enable not just our people to be, um, to, be, to be able to participate in the smart city, but 
the non-human. And I say that's where ChatGPT and chatbots are actually useful and we can get, get, get scared about what they're doing, but we can also start to use them for, uh, for things that really matter and maybe create ways to break down barriers between the sort of non-human and the human worlds or to create ways to create other, way, other ways to communicate where we're part of that conversation. So this, in this one, you can talk to the park or you can talk to a sort of personified butterfly. And that's been one of the ways that we have where you can chat to the park. So um, I'm going to sum up now. Um, I've hopefully given you some idea of what, uh, probably not what you expected, but some idea of what a connected neighborhood might look like when we integrate these different layers of social, spatial, and digital. Um, and I think that's part of trying to think again around how the digital is not operating in a different structural sense. We're not treating it as a different thing. We're starting to integrate it back into our local places and see it as socially constructed. And if we do so, we start to get, like I said, that added value about how we can start to re-inhabit. And when it starts to go into the libraries, the parks, um, the, the streets, that's when it starts to become powerful and help us to really think about resilient communities and um, some of the ways in which we move forward in some of the broader urban challenges that we have. So hopefully to come back to some of the, the key thoughts I've tried to we had at the beginning, and you probably thought, what was that all about? Hopefully, I've given you a little bit of an insight into sort of thinking about, one, what are smart cities? Uh, two, the idea that technology is socially constructed rather than uh, deterministic and top-down, um, that it can support a sense of place and community if it's done in ways that are thoughtful and place-based and people-centric. Um, and I've hopefully given you some ideas about what it might mean that we have neighbourhoods uh, so we've looked at Jane Jacobs' neighbourhood at the beginning and how that became a sort of uh, a test bed for how we think about what neighbourhoods mean in terms of urban space. And rather than the city as this sort of rather behemoth, actually it's neighbourhoods that matter because they're, they're the places where people come together, they're where we have social capital and social glue. But if we start to take some of the um, qualities of digital and recombine them at a neighbourhood scale, we might start to, to create um, powerful space, powerful ways to address some of the urban challenges that we have. So, you know, this comes back really to um, the SDGs and thinking about cities and communities, SDG 11 is cities and communities, smart cities are part of that mix. Um, so we take a bit of Jacobs, some of the value of, of the space of Chennai that was being lost in these top-down smart infrastructural smart city projects and in saw, instead saw some of those spaces already smart and then some of these uh, democratic and, and, and collaborative spaces that we have in the, in the Amsterdam example. That might be an example of how the social, the spatial, sorry, the spatial, the social and the digital, we can recombine those together. We might be able to address some of those bigger challenges, like I said, we see with the SDGs. Um, in terms of thinking about new models of how we live in the future and what connected neighbourhoods might mean um, in terms of how we address some of our urban challenges in a way that's co-designed and um, developed with people in, in mind and giving them the right to the access of that space. Um, <laughs> I'm going to sum up there. Um, that's uh, going to conclude my talk um, and I'd be really happy to answer questions um, and uh, yeah, hear, hear, hear any thoughts you have about what I'm putting forward. Thank you for your time. And, um, and actually, I'll start from a question which is kind of directly related to, to, the, to the talk. So it's, you know, and <laughs> yeah, di and directly re direct related to what you've described at some point, and which was about the Chennai example. And uh, so a person, anonymous, is asking, how was the recommendation to develop smart citizenship that respects the informal incompleteness received by those decision makers in India. So how has Chennai changed, if any Well, I mean, there's the simple fact is they didn't deliver the smart city project that was in the, the proposal. So that, that sort of stalled, stalled that, that, that top-down approach because they found that there was, having, having argued they'd done some consultation, they found that some of the ways that we were sort of engaging with local people started to create new, new ideas. But practically, it, was, um, it wasn't just us, it was actually the fact that they weren't going to work because they were top down and they hadn't understood the local place. And cities, as Assassin argues, cities talk back. They don't, they don't take kindly to things that don't work. <laughs> cities are complex and quite tricky spaces to work. They don't change quickly. So if you haven't done the co-design, if you haven't really understood what's needed, actually it's quite difficult to implement at scale. So, you know, the large 
the, the, the aspiration of that very um, utopian top-down, let's change a whole neighbourhood, is tricky to deliver in any sense. And if you haven't done that sense of understanding what, what really works and building it on a, on a, track, you know, on, on a basis of, what, what's, um, of how people are involved, it's quite difficult to deliver. So we went back, um, I think, three years later and found that not just Chennai, but a lot of the smart city mission projects in India hadn't been delivered as planned. They hadn't spent the money because they couldn't get them on the ground. And that's been, that's been a tale that we see globally. And that's one of the reasons why we've come to the, the UN Habitat isn't doing this out of the kindness of its heart. It's because there needs to be another way to do it and it needs to be people centric and involving local people is not a sort of, you know, attacking it on the end. It's because otherwise things don't work and we can't deliver urban, urban generation without um, people and a much more sort of citizen centric approach. I won't mention the project in Plymouth. And, and one of the interesting things is that often when things are done, are developed on it with a, with a techno-centric type of approach, you know, and there has been some interesting publications from Barcelona, for instance, you know, you end up spending a lot of money on a lot of infrastructure, a lot of digital infrastructure, and then becomes pretty obsolete pretty quickly. And then you have a lot of wrecks, digital wrecks, uh, you know, where the sensors, where there are the things, etc., kind of scattered in the city, which are not used uh, uh, anymore uh, because they've never been used because they were not kind of uh, designed with people in mind. Um, okay, uh, should we get? Yes, there is a the gentleman over there uh, who's a professor of poetry who wants to ask a question. Can you hear me? Good. Yes. Um, really, really wonderful and exciting. And I am wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the role of the smart city in terms of influencing and benefiting um, health and well-being in perhaps multiple deprivation zones. Yeah, so again, starting with what's the challenge? So I think we start with, well, what's the, what's the thing that we want to address in those? And so one of the projects we've had in Plymouth, we had a UKRI place-based partnership of public engagement working in Stonehouse, where Stonehouse has one of the lowest levels of, de sorry, highest levels of deprivation around health. So we looked at trying to work actually around social prescribing. I know, you, I know you're something involved in looking at how we could use a digital to sort of support social prescribing. Could we prescribe digital? Um, and there's also, we've got the, um, obviously we've got gold and um, uh, the um, uh, iconic projects. I blame Ray for the the names, <laughs> but they're looking at how we use health, and that's not that, that's whether we call it smart, but it's using those sort of technologies where we're connecting with people. I mean, one of the great ways has been looking at how, for example, virtual reality can connect people who can't travel to the inequality of mobility, and how you can overcome that through digital. I can't physically move to a place, so one of the things is you know, put people up, try and arrange transport to the well spaces of well-being, green spaces, outdoor spaces. Can we connect people in other ways and get some of those well-being benefits? So that's been some of the ways where digital has sort of overcome some of the barriers where you can access spaces that are restorative, but you can also um, do that in a way that's not replacing the actual space as well. Okay, I'll, I know there's a Professor Vister here who's kind of... Um, Rare to ask, but uh, I will pick another one from uh, from the online, and which is about uh, inclusion, and and I think it's quite it's quite important. That the, the the question is how do we ensure all the people aren't left feeling confused and left behind when using modern technology to make changes? So how do we include uh, aging an aging population within within smart and with smart cities? Yeah, so, I mean, um, I haven't talked about the work I've done around digital inclusion, but I've done quite a lot of work looking at who's included and what digital inclusion means, uh, because, again, it, it's a fallout. The minute you start to think about how you're doing smart cities is you think, well, who's, who's, not, who's not smart? <laughs> and, of course, the people, who older, older generation, us are, are wise. Um, so what we... <laughs> wise and should... Um, but what we found is that... Um, there's lots of benefits for how, when you bring out the skills, so, so we, really there's a skills gap. Um, and the skills gap in the older generation is, again, not necessarily um, a result, you know, result of their generational things. And so we bring out technology in the context of what they want to do. So a lot of the ways we've seen is we found older people maybe um, have, have access, you know, access issues and how we can show how digital enables them to overcome some of those access issues, how it enables them to connect with family and friends elsewhere. So trying to build back 
the pattern of where the exclusion is, is excluding them, not just from the digital, but also from their participation in society and bringing them back as active uh, members of society. I mean, like I mentioned, the, um, the Iconic and Gold projects, which I'm part of, which are led by the Faculty of Health, another way we're doing that is looking at intergenerational. So they're looking at linking up, oh, Marius is here, linking up um, younger people and older people. So you get that, that transfer of knowledge. So the younger people who have the skills and the older people who have the knowledge but don't necessarily have the skills to match of trying to do that intergenerational um, knowledge exchange as well. So that's another model of how you do that. But there's many, again, place-based linking in with local places. So where um, people come together, bringing the digital into that. I've done a lot of work around the role of community centres and embedding digital within the everyday activities that happen within them. Yeah, and I was going to say, in fact, it's a great vehicle to togetherness, you know, that type of inter intergenerational work. Uh, James. I thought that was an absolute tour de force. Um, oh, I have, a, I have a microphone, so I'll be even louder. <laughs> I thought, I th absolutely professorial. I thought it was uh, outstanding. Um, <laughs> talk and I've got at least three interrelated questions that I but I won't answer ask no, as give, give us one as a historian I'm really interested in looking at the transformation of the city across the long durée and I'm interested in where the digital sits because many of the sort of processes that you're you're thinking about have been done by other means in in other ways but I think I think what my my big question is a is a methodological and conceptual one because I think if you look at, at Jacobs as your sort of inspirational sort of you know starting point for this the model of um, of the city that kind of sense of, of of sort of new models of citizenship and governance that is connected to technologies and AI is a very liberal and democratic one mm. flipped on and, and, and absolutely social but if we flip that on its head and we think about that from the sort of from the sort of control point of view. We flip that so that it's about ideology, it's about politics. Um, what is the use of smart cities in places like Russia or China or autocratic regimes? What we have is actually a, at least a, a sort of tension between a sort of a model of AI in the West that is democratic and open, and a model elsewhere that is absolutely the polar opposite. So how does that fit in, how does that, how do smart cities fit in that kind of framework? Well, I think it'd be lovely if we had that nice binary of the West is good and yeah, these, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I think we'll find that there is, there is, I mean, there's a lot of concern around the Chinese model of surveillance and datafying, so c c citizens are data objects. Um, there, is a, there is a lot of um, use of surveillance um, whether that's smart, some of those technologies are smart. Um, we also have that in the, we also have that in buckets, um, and actually we don't seem to have an awareness. So at least in China, it is up front and is part of. We have it here, and we are not aware. We don't understand the implications because we don't have the skill sets, and we don't understand the governance issues because we see technology as infrastructural interface. So what I'm arguing with smart cities is, as it becomes spatial and social we start to understand how it affects us at, in, the, in, our every, in our lives and we, start, we need to reclaim it. So that Who Smart City was very much about going, we cannot just assume that some benign techno, te technology is not neutral. Technology is, so if we look at some of the key organisations delivering AI, some of the uh, Western organisations, Palantir, um, who are now going very heavily into NHS, they are not benign and they will make a significant change in our democratic decision-making approach. So we, do, we need to reclaim it and we need to start to understand it on our own benefit. So like the chat BTP, the, you know, the, the hysteria is really a lack of knowledge from our own, not, 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 not from here, <laughs> yeah. there is knowledge, but a lack of knowledge in our society about how digital is something that we need to be um, active. You know, we are a university, we talked about this before, we're a university where we're bringing the skill sets of the future generations, and unless we're training our students to understand the ethics and the, the governance and the, the, the democratic implications of AI, we are not going to build those skill sets for the future. So there's a lot of work around um, rethink, you know, actually thinking about how digital is not a neutral, it is political and it is social. And I would argue spatial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> Th 
Thanks, Catherine. Uh, great talk. Um, I'm not a professor, it's okay to ask a question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just interested in um, how a smart, well, I just think that um, first of all, before you can have a smart city, you've got to have a safe city. And um, I wonder how the smart city concept fits into places which are like no-go areas, sink estates, places where people are frightened to go out after a certain time in the evening. Well, I mean, again, I don't think the smart city is going to solve, or again, this idea that it solves urban problems. So one of the first things you often see in a, some of the smart city 1.0 is the city is a problem and how the smart city is going to solve it. And I hopefully I've argued that that's, that's a false, like, this false argument. And we start with what's the thing we need to address. So if, if fear, if safety, if, if safety is one of the things we need to address in our cities, um, there are many ways that we do that and whether technology is going to be the right solution. Um, one of the ways we can is um, the way that if, so some of the ways that the urban space is currently is it's, it's, em it's empty and we don't have people there. Jacob's argued that people create safe spaces, Pe people attract people, which creates governance, which creates a model of sort of trust and um, you know, civicness in the space. So whether we can start to think about how um, sort of the, some of the technology, we, you know, we create live spaces where people are coming back into some of the urban spaces that are currently empty, particularly at night, say. Um, but I think the issue of fear, um, well, I mean, I'd, actually, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I did a workshop with a, a school in Hackney in East London. It was working with Citizens UK, one of the sort of leading advocacy groups for citizen organisations. Um, we did a workshop mapping their experience of the urban space. And the park for people in girls in Hackney and London was the most dangerous space for them to go to. So they would not go, you know, so that was where people got, you know, there was a lot of knife crime. And they could map that space. So we were starting to get them to understand how they might start to use, create activities that would re-inhabit that space and repopulate and reclaim it for themselves. So um, I don't think SMART is going to solve, that's not, that's, that's just one part of a mix. But creating new models of how people participate and look after the urban space and, and act in it and re repopulate it. And like I said, parks seem like a strange idea to think about how we use technology, but I think there are some really interesting ways in which the digital placemaking approach might start to create um, other ways in which we think about how we, in we go into those, some of those common spaces that we want to re-inhabit. Re <laughs> All right, I think we could go on and on, and I have a lot of questions here. Some of them are quite interesting, and but it's 20 past, so maybe should we uh, kind of enjoy ourselves out there and <laughs> have, a, <laughs> have a quick kind of drink and keep chatting and keep talking, Catherine, and amongst ourselves. Thanks very much.